This is a mind map. Mind maps were coined by Tony Buzan in 1974. Your pattern is becoming an environmentally enclosed one. This is what Justin Sung calls a mind map. These don't look very similar, and I'd like answers. Today, we'll look at the academic literature on mind mapping from a learning perspective. Let's find out what the authorities say. Let's make a Busan mind map about Busan mind maps. First, we'll open up our copy of Mind Map Mastery to make sure we adhere to Tony's 10 laws. Busan mind maps have a central subject. Like everything else in the mind map, it's accompanied by images and symbols. Branches radiate and taper outward from the center. Each branch gets one keyword, and that keyword is capitalized. Different branches get different colors. Connections can be represented by stylized arrows, or blank space. And finally, the mind map should look nice and balanced. Buzan says mind maps can be used in infinite ways, but from a learning perspective, they're most well known as a mnemonic device for memorizing. Pretty useful, pretty fun. But from a learning perspective, I think they are too hierarchical, don't scale well to large topics, have unclear relationships, and don't have a focus on higher order learning. So how do we get from here to grind maps. We need a bridge. Joseph Novak developed concept maps in 1972. His goal was to create a method that encourages meaningful learning. He also wanted to provide a window into how someone's understanding changes and improves over time. Here's Novak's process for creating a concept map. We start with a focus question. It should not be a simple topic like neuroscience. It should be a deep question that requires explanation, like why is the brain considered the center of cognition? Or why do concept maps encourage learning? Based on that question, we find 15 to 25 concepts and put them to the side in a parking lot. We then order them from general to specific to make the next steps easier. Taking one keyword at a time, we build a representation of our understanding of the topic. When connecting keywords, we write down the explicit relationships between them. To show other relationships, we can even add non-hierarchical connections, called crosslinks. Usually the map is organized into a few levels of hierarchy, where the bottommost layer is examples. The combination of two concepts and a link makes a proposition, aka declarative knowledge. An example would be neuron sends a signal. The clear problem here is that everything in the world is related in some way. How do we choose which relationships to show? Novak points us to Bloom's taxonomy. He says we should identify and create only the most prominent and useful relationships, as defined by the higher orders of Bloom's taxonomy. Continuing, we now have a parking lot from which we created a preliminary map with higher order relationships. The next steps are to keep adding to the concept map through three or more cycles. Each time, we add new concepts and rearrange the existing ones. Finally, we do one last pass and clean up the mind map to make it more presentable. Now that we've looked at Buzan mind maps and Novak concept maps, by which criteria do we compare these and Justin Sung's grind maps? <laughs> The research has a lot to say about this. I've tried to consolidate down to a few key ideas. A basic architectural comparison can be made based on three design decisions. We could look at the steps taken to create a diagram, the rules of the final diagram, and thus what it actually looks like, and the checklist for how we or an expert evaluate the final diagram. We can also consider more nuanced criteria both abstract and practical. First, we can look at the depth of learning that the method encourages. In terms of higher order learning, concept maps have a clear upper hand. They answer a deep focus question and connections are made based on evaluative processing. In terms of elaboration quality, both methods encourage us to make connections with existing knowledge. Concept maps might have the upper hand again because of their explicit relationships, but Buzan mind maps uniquely encourage visual elaboration. The human brain is amazing. Brain is fiendishly complex. But it does have limitations, so using a tool that complements it would be ideal. One criteria we can evaluate these methods by is how well they offload our cognition. Buzan mind maps use dual coding with visuals and words and do an okay job spacing things out into chunks. 
Additionally, Buzon mind maps use spatial relationships and images to improve memorability. Even Novak himself admits concept maps aren't great for rote memorization. Practically, we want our learning methods to be repeatable and rigorous. We want learning biology on a Tuesday to go just as well as calculus on a Friday. Bazan mind maps do have 10 laws, but concept maps have explicit steps and make the user create explicit relationships. Finally, we have to look at usability. None of the criteria we've talked about so far matter if we don't actually use the technique because it's too much work. The explicit steps and relationships in concept maps can be overwhelming and tedious for a new practitioner. However, that's only usability on the encoding side. After mind mapping, we need to evaluate the work. Feedback is a core component of learning. Evaluating Buzon mind maps objectively is not easy. There is a Buzon mind mapping competition with criteria, but it's not really learning related criteria. Concept maps are a little better at being evaluated. They focus on explicit higher order relationships and hierarchy, which lend them to objective critiques. In the literature, there is both qualitative and quantitative criteria. The qualitative criteria is pretty interesting. It mentions that we shouldn't create maps that look like a spoke or a chain. Our concept maps should look a little bit more like a net. Now we understand Buzon mind maps, Novak concept maps, and the criteria by which we can evaluate and create these methods. Before we dive into grind maps though, I want to quickly highlight some smaller methods. A visual metaphor is a metaphor that we draw. It could be the three pillars of mind maps, a pyramid taxonomy, or even conjoined triangles. Take a look at the conjoined triangles of success. We know from the last video that creating analogies and metaphors instigates good germane cognitive load. So while this doesn't compare to the size of mind maps and concept maps, it can be really useful for consolidating, interleaving, and memorizing. However, like mind maps, it can be hard to evaluate objectively. On the other hand, drawing plain old diagrams like flowcharts can be a great way to construct our own understanding. As a bonus, it can be objectively evaluated. For example, while reading about a process, we might draw it out and then compare the drawing to the ground truth to get feedback on our understanding. It's a trade-off. We're working at a lower levels of blooms, but we're definitely getting the benefits of offloading and feedback. Justin Sung's grind map methods are spread out over a lot of YouTube videos. It can be hard to put it all together. What we have to do is look at the three architectural components from earlier and use Bazan and Novak's approaches as a baseline. For the creation steps, grind maps are very similar to Novak's concept maps. Both create a keyword list. Like what you can do is you can create a list of keywords and then you can create a sub list of keywords. Both build the mind map starting from the big picture. You know, kind of like a basic backbone that I'm creating. This is the overall structure of the topic. Both build outward from the big picture. You want to do broad topic first, and then you want to do the whole topic again, but at, at another level of detail and in another level of detail. Both go through multiple iterations of keyword collection and mapping. Simplify it, group it, make it make more sense. Then add on the next set of keywords. Pause, group it, simplify it, connect it, and then continue to do that again and again until you finish that list. Both focus on the most important relationships as defined by Bloom's taxonomy. And thinking which concepts or which chunk and group of information is more important than another group, it forces you to examine them in a more critical level of depth. And both include cleaning the mind map. The process of making it cleaner that forces you to activate higher order learning in terms of Bloom's taxonomy. The biggest difference, in my opinion, is that Novak's concept maps start with a deep evaluative focus question. The focus question directs the learning and encourages deep processing. Grind maps don't have this. It's unclear what a grind map is supposed to be about. A topic? A chapter? I really like Novak's focus question because asking different questions instigates different types of thinking. It even changes the traversal order of the material. You could ask two different questions about the topic and get two very different maps. Here's a side-by-side -side of a Buzon map, a Novak map, and a grind map from a Justin Sung video. I really like the grouping in grind maps, or as Justin calls it, chunking. 
It's an improvement over concept maps, and definitely resembles the spacing of Busan maps. But it moves away from the purely hierarchical grouping, subtly improving the visual layout. Of course, there are trade-offs to everything. While making the grouping more freeform improves usability and encourages different thinking, that means we're also making it harder to evaluate objectively. Emphasis in grind maps would make Novak happy. Novak wants us to choose relationships that are prominent and useful. Emphasizing relationships in grind maps takes that a little further. It's asking, of the prominent relationships we've chosen, which are the most important? Directionality is somewhere between Busan and concept maps. Busan maps have lines, grind maps have arrows, and concept maps have explicitly named relationships. The trade-off here is that more explicit relationships ensure active thinking. However, they also tend to get more tedious. Plain lines aren't tedious, but can be drawn without really considering what their relationship is. Grind maps are trying to find a balance between these two. Whether or not that balance overly compromises is up for interpretation. All three methods use spatial layout and arrows, but how pictorial they are is different. Bazan mind maps are basically artwork. They really emphasize abstract, fun visualizations for memorability. Grind maps are a bit vague with this, but they include doodles and symbols. Concept maps ignore visuals and focus on the encoding aspect rather than memorability. In a way, grind maps are, again, a compromise between the two, but it's unclear why memorability is a focus when the goal is higher order learning, not rote memorization. From a learning perspective, I think I'd prefer to see visual metaphors and diagrams. They're kind of like scratch work at a higher level of Bloom's taxonomy especially when compared to mnemonic devices like doodles and symbols. But of course, doodles can be used for dual coding and elaboration, so don't throw them out. For objective evaluation, I didn't find too much in Justin's YouTube videos. In Novak's concept maps, we're supposed to watch out for spokes and chains. There is some evidence that grind maps have similar criteria. Yeah, this is just like a single chain. But Busan and Novak maps have published criteria that people can use like a checklist. Grind maps have the grind criteria itself, but as far as I can tell, grind maps lag behind here. Hopefully, the relationships between different methods is a lot more clear. We looked at how Justin Sung's grind maps probably draw heavily from the literature on Novak's concept maps. However, we also saw how grind maps made positive tweaks in usability and organization, and brought over doodles from Busan maps. But we also looked at visual metaphors, diagrams, and fundamental criteria for good learning. It's not hard to imagine improving on grind maps in a personalized way with experiments and self-regulation. Thank you